Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 514th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Have you ever pondered why you do what you do? Well, I have for over four decades. And I do all of this because I believe the most important thing that we can be doing right now is learning where our food comes from and how to grow our own. Our food structure in this country is in crisis. It delivers food that is unhealthy and is a delivery system that is tenuous at best. Over the decades, I've seen the extraordinary impact that small groups of people can have on the global food consciousness community, and I need your help. If you find value in the Urban Farm podcast, please consider joining the Urban Farm patron community to support the work we do. In exchange for subscribing, you will receive content and bonuses far beyond the free podcast episodes that we deliver. Plus, I am committed to making sure the value you receive goes far beyond what you contribute. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to see what you receive when you join us in revolutionizing our food system. Please consider supporting our work. It might be the most important thing you ever do. Today on our podcast, we have someone who maximizes the benefit of rainwater for both personal and community use. We're talking with returning guest Brad Lancaster about harvesting the rain. Brad runs a successful permaculture consulting design and education business in Tucson, Arizona. He is focused on integrated and sustainable approaches to landscape design, planning, and living. Growing up in a dryland environment, water harvesting has long been one of his specialties and is a true passion. He is the author of Permaculture Bibles for Water Harvesting, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, Volumes 1 and 2, and he has just released new full-color revised and expanded editions of both. Hey, Brad, we've been enjoying visiting with you in podcast episodes 110 and 393, talking about rainwater harvesting and wild food forestry. Welcome back to the show today. Are you ready to rock? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So can you bring us up to speed on what's been going on since uh, we chatted last? Well, the biggest thing, as you were mentioning in that intro, is the uh, the recent release of the two brand new editions of my rainwater harvesting books. That's been fantastic to get them out in full color form and to have also been able to have the opportunity to make changes I'd long wanted to make but just didn't have the time in life and finally got that opportunity and yeah, I'm just overjoyed. They're, they're now the books that I always envisioned and more. And the other sweet thing is uh, with volume one, it's not just a print edition I've come out with. I've also just come out with a new ebook edition of that book. So everyone can have the book on their phone at any time. Awesome. So get your Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, volume one, and get it wherever you buy books, preferably at one of your local bookstores. And the reason I said it that way is because, and I shared this with Brad a little earlier, I was at a bookstore yesterday buying a book and there was this gentleman that walked in to pick up a book that he had ordered and it was Brad's book. How do you feel about that, Mr. Lancaster? Love it. The more of that, the better. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. So when did these books come out? Yeah, so it was 2006 is when I came out with the first edition. And it's been amazing what has changed since then. Because uh, back then, almost nobody had even heard the term water harvesting. So I just get blank stares when I bring it up. Right. And then if, if by luck someone did know about it, it was real challenging because there were a number of the key strategies were illegal at the time or really cost prohibitive because of misinformed policy. So, for example, at that time, it was illegal to cut street curbs to direct street runoff into street side rain gardens or basins that then freely irrigated the associated vegetation that could grow to shade and cool those streets. And with gray water harvesting uh, at the time, or just a little bit, bef- just a little bit before the book had been released, you were required to do these very complex, ineffective systems if you were to do it legally. 
But right around the time the book came out, the the laws changed, and you could then legally harvest your gray water with no tank, very inexpensive, very effective, safe systems, basically just directing your drain water to those same rain gardens, mulch and vegetated basins. So you can turn that so-called wastewater into a resource water. So uh, since the book came out, these practices that had been shunned, now they're very common. I mean, you can go to any neighborhood in Tucson and see examples of this. Most people are aware of it. They may not be practicing it, but they're aware of what it is. And what has was illegal is now legal. It's incentivized, especially in Tucson. You can get up to a $2,000 rebate to do these things. It's been mandated. So in new road construction, it's mandated that you harvest the runoff off of those roads in adjoining landscapes. And in new home construction, it's now mandated that you create a gray water harvesting stub out within the home, which is a section of pipe in the wall and floor just waiting for you. You don't have to hook up to it, but if you want to, you just open a hatch and connect the drain pipe to that pipe sitting and waiting. And you can direct the water out to your landscape without jackhammering your floor or walls. So it's it's been a 180 degree shift. Nice. Since these books came out and going from, you know, maybe a a dozen practitioners to now there being tens of thousands of practitioners. Mm. So that's been phenomenal. And there's whole companies have now um, formed around the harvest of water, the passive harvest of sun and shade as I advocate in volume 1. And a number of companies have transformed their offerings. For example, Mark Regal, he used to run patio pools down here in Tucson. Now he runs uh, Water Harvesting International. So uh, he took his knowledge of how to build pools and transformed it in how to create water harvesting systems and tanks. And he does incredible jobs modifying existing pools which are water consumers, into water conservers, into cisterns, water harvesting tanks. So, yeah, it's just been, it's just been phenomenal to see what's happened. And, and I think a big part of it is that the books gave people this knowledge. It was readily at hand. People could see the potential because I've made a real concerted effort to enable people to see in a new way. So I compare the conventional way of doing things with an illustration on the left to the water harvesting vision and potential on the right. And people can see with just very simple tweaks how you can have tremendous positive effect. For example, instead of planting on draining mound-like hills or landscapes, plant within or beside basin-like shapes because everything moves with gravity unless right. money's behind it. So these basin shapes collect rainwater, stormwater, all waters, gray water, air conditioning, condensate, and they also help collect organic matter and fertility, whereas these hill shapes, they drain all the resources away. So it's, it's really the, the idea is to create these passive nets that just keep harnessing more and more potential and fertility. Nice. So 13 years the first one came yeah. out 13 years ago. What yeah. what has been the effect that you've seen? Because you've you've printed tens of thousands of copies of this, I know. What kind of effect, what kind of impact have they had? Yeah, well, that's the wild thing is uh, I've sold over 50,000 copies of the previous editions of the books. So the, the effect has been, in big part, changing the law. So it was due to the strategies and also the, the strategies within the books and also the demonstration site, I'll call it a pre-legal public demonstration site, pilot project site, practicing a lot of these strategies. They showed the policymakers, the lawmakers, the inspect, the uh, development services inspectors and so on, and the contractors, what's possible and how to do it. And creating these demonstration sites and the writing of these books, I really pushed to continually uh, evolve the practices and take in maximum consideration so it, it works for all, not just water harvesters. So, for example, when I was working with the city of Tucson to legalize the harvest of street runoff in streetside basins, I was bringing up all kinds of concerns they'd never even thought of. <laughs> right. Wow. So I was like, look, you know, we got to size these appropriately so we don't 
block the access of people getting out of cars that want to step up onto the public walkway or sidewalk. So let's ensure we never have a rain garden longer than an average car length. That way, people can park the car so the car doors open to the pathway between these rain garden basins and give full access to the sidewalk or the earthen walkway on the other side. I think because I had been looking at so many of those details, that also opened the door and dropped some of the fear threshold amongst city officials when we were having those meetings. But I also have to give a lot of credit to the city because uh, it was really group mind where we were looking at a lot of different issues, challenges, and potential. And working together as a team, we created development standards and, and policy, a permitting process that, that really upped up the game on everything. So, yeah. So the books have helped uh, legalize previously illegal practices. They've helped generate all these businesses, these practitioners and whatnot. They've made water harvesting part of the common lexicon and terminology in the drylands of not just uh, the Southwest U.S., but all over the world. This is a crazy thing is these books, they became a kind of a passport for me, an invitation to travel the world, um, which I'd never anticipated. So I've, I've taught in over 24 countries and it all has, the invitation to do so has all originated really from a, the practice that predated the books, which is just what I would call conscious shovel work. <laughs> okay? nice. As opposed yeah. to much more common unconscious shovel work where I'm doing the least amount of shovel work necessary for the greatest positive effect. And the key to doing all that is to really see what's happening on the land before you tr try any, any interventions. So you're, you're working with what already exists and with the potential that's already at hand. So everything costs way less, it's less work. Because my work is based on conscious shovel work, it's accessible to everyone, whatever their income, because most of the work costs no more than the price of a shovel. And so I think that also was really big behind the popularity of, of this too. And there's been, there's efforts all over the world, individuals, organizations that have been pushing this for decades as well. So it was great to be able to join, join that team. No kidding. Wow. All right. So I have a bunch of questions that I wanted to ask you, but now I've got a bunch of questions from just our last seven minutes of talking. What I heard you say is that with these two volumes, you've really created a guideline book for municipalities to start thinking about rainwater and graywater harvesting. Is that the case? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and it, it's coupled with an, the national effort around green infrastructure. But a big part of it is, okay, let's let's start to see the resources and potential that's always been here, but perhaps up till now has been invisible to us or ignored at great cost. So, for example, okay, we in Tucson and you in Phoenix, we live in dry land environment. So we, we think we live in a place of water scarcity, but in reality, that's not the case. So more rain falls on the surface area of Tucson in a typical year of rain than the entire population of over a half million people consume of municipal water in a year. So more rain falls on our desert community in a year than the community consumes of water in a year. So that right there, that that's a big slap in the face, aha moment of, wow, well, if there's so much water, how come it doesn't feel like it? Well, because the way we build our built environment, and too often in the past codes have required this, we drain that free water right out of the system as quickly as possible, thereby dehydrating our community. It's kind of like a dysentery by design. Right. So you're, you're basically spraying the stormwater out of the system as fast as possible as soon as it hits the ground. What I advocate is the total opposite of let's, let's grab and hold that water as quickly as possible and let's hold on to it as long as possible in a way that we're not hoarding it, but in a way that we reinvest or infiltrate that water into living systems, tanks as well, but I primarily focus on living systems that uh, act like living sponges that then grow 
more resources like living shade of edible shade trees, which further reduce our otherwise increasing temperatures, which makes for a more comfortable, joyous environment. Uh, it helps us gain greater food security. It reduces downstream flooding because we no longer have water leaving the site very quickly. Instead, it takes a long time for water to leave the site. We can recharge groundwater tables. We can help bring back once dead rivers and springs. So it's, it's a great way of giving back more than we take. And that's ultimately my challenge with my books and my work is how can we as individuals, how can we as communities give back more than we take? So how can Tucson and Phoenix flip things? So instead of extracting, taking water from the Colorado River and con contributing to its downstream death, how can we instead give more water back to the Colorado River in a way that its flow becomes healthier and more consistent than ever before, in a way that dramatically improves the lives of all those downstream, as well as us right here, and as well as those upstream as we help mot uh, motivate and inspire them with better ways. So that's my goal, so that we can improve life right now for ourselves and for future generations. So I love it that you, you shared with us the impact that your books have had. And that, what I just heard you share, was your intention for the future of your books. I love that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a big reason, too, uh, Greg, why I went to full color with the new editions is I, I want it to be even juicier, more enticing imagery. And it, it's easier to pick up on the subtleties of the patterns of water and sediment flow I try and bring out in the book's illustrations. And the color really helps with that. It's also why I um, came out with the digital ebook edition, because I don't want the insane shipping costs of shipping the books internationally or the printing costs to be a deterrent. So I want people anywhere to be able to to get a copy of the book at an affordable price. Especially in uh, third world countries where they don't necessarily, they're not able to get the books, but they could get them digitally. Yeah. And uh, it's been wild, you know, as I've been teaching in rural, poor communities in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Nepal, Mexico, and the U.S., everyone's got smartphones. <laughs> right. So, yeah, everyone can have it in their pocket. Nice. One of the things I want to point out, this is called rainwater harvesting for dry lens and beyond. So this isn't just a water harvesting book for dry lens areas. Somebody in Michigan could use these concepts. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, my first edition of the book, it was just rainwater harvesting for dry lands because I just wanted to make very clear uh, my experiential bias coming from a dry land environment. But uh, even with that first edition, it's been just as applicable in wet climates. And everywhere in the world that has at least a dry season, even if it's very short and otherwise it's a wet climate, as long as they have a dry season, you will find a, a rich history of water harvesting. Now, maybe so, maybe much of that history has been forgotten since the introduction of mechanical water pumps, but the history and traditions existed before that and oftentimes are experiencing a, a, a renaissance. And I found that all these practices, these strategies, these, these guiding principles that I have in my books, they work, they work everywhere. The only thing that changes is the plant palette that you use. So you'll have greater success if you use the, the native, the indigenous plants to your area, best adapted to your local climate, wildlife, season, soils, and so on. And let me try and illustrate that a little bit more. So I've had the chance to, to teach in Tennessee and Georgia. So they get five times the rain that we do here in Tucson, Arizona. But we're, we're implementing the same practices, but just with the plants of Tennessee and Georgia. So they get five times the rain that we do here. Their plants are accustomed to five times the rainfall that we get here. <laughs> so that's why we have to use their local plants there and why we cannot use their plants here. And when people are wondering, well, you know, how would I even know what plant to plant where in relationship to a rain garden? My answer to that is go take a hike to the local part of your intact ecosystem and see what plants naturally grow, grow in the low spots where more water and sediment accumulate. Those are the species that are going to do great in the bottom of your built 
uh, rain gardens. What are the species that grow in the higher, drier areas? Well, those are the ones that are going to do better on the top zone. See, I, I like to break my rain gardens into three zones. So if you imagine a basin that's got a level bottom basin, that's the bottom zone. And it's on the banks, it's got a, a planting terrace halfway between the bottom and the top. That's the terrace zone. And then outside of the basin completely on the periphery, that's the top zone. So I just keep it just to three. It's real easy. And I've been working with local uh, nurseries to list on their plant identification signs which ideal rain garden planting zone is best for each plant. Oh, nice. And, uh, and this has been huge because most folks don't have a very deep knowledge of plants. They just say, hey, you know, I want a beautiful red flowering plant. They can now go to these nurseries and they can say, hey, I want a beautiful red flowered plant, but I want one that does great in the bottom zone of my rain garden back home. Or I want one that's great for the terrace zone or the top. And they say, oh, perfect. Here's the bottom zone plants. Here's the terrace zone. And here's the top zone. So it makes it easier for everyone to do the right thing. It enables the nursery to provide a higher value product and enables the citizenry to have a much greater level of success and thus more people enticed because they see these beautiful rain gardens and more of their community. Oh, that is so cool. Thanks for thinking all the way through that. That took some thought. How did you get to that? <laughs> uh, well, that came from frustration of seeing people putting the wrong plant in the wrong place. All right. <laughs> and, and myself being guilty of that when I started this work, you know, because uh, most of uh, the landscape industry is focused around plants from somewhere else being irrigated with water pumped in from somewhere else. Yep. Whereas what I'm advocating is how can we do the most starting with the plants that are uniquely of here and ideally evolved to thrive here. And then let's use free on-site waters rather than expensive imported waters, thereby eliminating the need for any irrigation pipe and leaks and pumps and utility bills right off the get-go. And that used to be the way. Right. <laughs> to exactly. The early 1900s when we got the mechanical pumps, you know, moving moving water. So yeah, it's kind of going back to old ways, but with some new innovations. So much of our movement is going that way, going back to old innovations, which is so incredibly cool. And one of the wonderful aspects of your book is that you give a lot of open-ended guidelines uh, in the form of principles like, and I love this principle because it's, for me, it's the first principle of permaculture, and that's start with long and thoughtful observation rather than just giving static recipes for strategies. And in my development, so I've been doing rainwater and graywater harvesting here at the urban farm for over 20 years. I What I've discovered here in Phoenix is that there isn't a subscribed way to exactly do anything. Each site is different. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get really frustrated when let's say folks uh, get enamored with a specific strategy or particular image or from a book or a development standard from a code book or whatnot and think, well, this has to be the way in a, in a rigid fashion. Whereas, no, no, I, I think we need to continually make room for innovation and make room to partner with the potential at a site rather than maybe fight it by not maybe unconsciously by ignoring it. And so that's a big goal of my principles is they're, they're open ended guidelines that are just trying to point you in the right direction or get you to consider, Hey, did I think of this? Did I, did I look for that? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do that before I really jump in. So yeah, the, the first one, start with a long and thoughtful observation. It's just get out onto your site and uh, ideally during a rainstorm and see where's the water going and where is it leaving. And then just try and make the least amount of change to keep that water around to greatest effect without any negative flooding. Yeah, I, I just find that huge. And maybe I can kind of illustrate through an example. Um, I got invited in to uh, teach a workshop in Alpine, Texas. And the I wasn't going to have a lot of time. I was only going to have you know half a day to prepare coming onto site before we taught the workshop the next day. So I did a lot of design on Google Earth. And I said, yeah, but it, it was a landscape around the public library where they had planted some 
oak trees that were dying because they weren't getting enough water. Most of the water was flowing off the site onto an adjoining property, flooding that building and then flooding into the street. So I, I made a design with a number of strategies that I thought would work. But then when I showed up onto the site and started checking the very subtle elevation differences, I realized, wow, my plan is not going to work. So that was the first lesson reminder that we should not be trying to impose an idea on a site. We should rather be trying to see, well, how can we work with what already exists here on the site? So I was panicking because the water utility had given us use of their backhoe and operator for that afternoon, and he's just waiting, the engine idling. So I was running around taking more and more measurements with the laser level of the elevations of the site, and uh, I just said, Brad, just stop panicking. <laughs> just kind of be calm and be present with what's going on the site, and it'll, it'll make itself apparent, the, the true plan. And then all of a sudden, I realized, wow, there is a huge natural basin already at this site where most of these dying trees are planted. But all, almost, I'd say 90% of the site's water runoff from the roof and the parking lot is bypassing this natural basin. There was a very subtle ridge line between where the water was flowing in this natural basin. So I threw out my plan and just told the back operator, all right, you just got to carve out a very subtle diversion berm, kind of a sausage-shaped berm that would direct the water over this subtle ridge line and into this deep, deep, this, uh, this very wide uh, natural basin. And boom, it was done. And uh, the next day of the workshop, we had the students finish it. I showed them how we figured things out. And then uh, just as we wrapped up, this massive thunderstorm came in. Oh, nice. And, and we got to see it all. And everything worked perfectly. And uh, the basin totally filled up. And it was a major storm. It took most of the storm to fill up. And then it had the natural spillway that was very spread out, very calm, no erosion. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. I've got a video of this on my website. The core lesson there is when I was able to let the site show me what was possible, rather than just imposing my preconceived plan, it was so much better. So all the principles in the book strive to let you do that and enable you to do that. Another one is start at the top of your watershed and work down. And the goal there is all too often people want to start at the bottom where they see all the water collecting. Well, now the bottom of your site is well hydrated, but the rest of your site is high, high dry, and dehydrated. So if we start closer to the top, closer to the source, we can spread more of the water around uh, for greater effect at less cost using the free power of gravity. So that principle is meant to just remind you, yeah, you see a lot of water down here, but hey, could we do something something above as well? What I've learned in almost 20 years of studying with you and almost 30 years of knowing you is uh, observation is key. And I often will tell people to spend a year on a property before they make any major changes to the space. And people will look at me funny like, I have to wait a year? And I'm not talking about minor things. I'm talking about, you know, major earthworks and that kind of stuff. And I found that that, that key is important. But the other thing that I've discovered about myself is the more I've done it, the more I see, just like with the example you just gave, you're able to stand, I'm able to stand back. I don't know about you, but I'm able to stand back and look at a piece of property and see where water runs just because I've been looking at it for so long. Have you found that that's the case for you that, hey, you've been doing this for 30 years now. You can kind of project what might be happening there in a rainstorm? Yeah, definitely. My my pattern awareness of water and sediment flow just gets better with practice. Though I'd say another big thing in my observation that's been really helpful to me, especially when I'm starting to jump to potential design aspects, is by asking the question, what's the desired effect? Not not what do I, what's the thing that I want? What's the desired effect? And that was the big thing at that Alpine library is the desired effect I wanted is I wanted to transform this channelized erosive flow of water that was flooding an adjoining property in the street. And I wanted to instead convert that flow into a more spread out flow through much more of the library's landscape that would hydrate it and stop the flooding of the neighbor. 
So there are lots of different ways of going about that. So that way I was able to start more open-ended. I, kn I know what I want the, the end effect to be, but how I achieve that could be, there's so many different possibilities. So uh, I opened myself to those possibilities rather than closing myself to a preconceived idea. Cool. So I've got one of your books in my hand, one of the brand new ones. Uh, this is volume one. Tell me why somebody should buy this book. Yeah, well, I think it's going to enable you to see differently than you likely see now. And it's also going to give you a way to communicate to potential contractors you might work with if you're getting things permitted with the city and whatnot so you can articulate what you're striving for. That is huge. It'll. I found a lot of people have been able to see right through shady fly-by-night contractors who really didn't know what they were doing after they had educated themselves with the book. The other great thing is it's going to enable you to figure out how much water do you have on site, not just rainwater, but stormwater, air conditioning, condensate, gray water, and so on. And what are your water needs? And how can you make the most of what water you have so that you can create a thriving landscape that does not need any imported virgin drinking waters. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, most of us irrigate with our uh, with municipal water, the water from the city line, mm -hmm. and that's that's drinking water. You know, huge amounts of resources have gone into purifying it, delivering it to your home at drinking water quality, and then you just put it right in the dirt. Well, that that's crazy. So how could we instead take a a so-called wastewater, like gray water, which you've already paid for, that's going down your drain. Instead of sending it to a distant sewer treatment plant, why not just treat it on site for free with gravity and living systems in your soil in a way that then grows shade trees that cool your house for free, dramatically reducing your summer cooling bill, also produce some food, okay, and so on. So, yeah, it's going to enable you to see how you get a lot more out of seemingly less, and uh, a big thing I've added in the new edition of Volume 1 is how you can estimate the water demand or the water needs of your landscape plants wherever you are in the U.S. So you can balance your water need with your free on-site water income. What I mean by that, your free on-site water income, that's the free rain falling on your site, you know, delivered to you free of charge, the storm water maybe currently flowing by in the, in the street in front of your place or down the alley. You can now re-divert that to your plantings. The gray water from your drains or the condensate, you know, air conditioners, atmospheric moisture condenses on the cold coil of the air conditioning unit, and we can access that. That's distilled water. So if you have an air conditioner, well, you should at least have a an associated plant or plantings that are irrigated for free from the condensate of that air conditioner, like your condensate spring, and use those tr those plants to shade and cool that air conditioner, which will further reduce the energy consumption of that air conditioner by 10 to 20%. Wow, how cool is that? One of the things I noticed about your books is they're significantly integrated. Can you tell us what that means and maybe have some examples? Yeah. So I kind of use the harvest of water as the bait to uh, entice people into even greater potentials. I, one thing that really frustrates me is when people will put in a water tank and they think, hey, I'm, I'm doing great. But if they're not really thinking in a more integrated way, that tank might create a lot of negatives. For example, Maybe they unconsciously place the tank on the south side of their house. And uh, this could be a benefit in winter. I'm sorry, in summer. But in winter, it's going to shade the side of the house that faces the low sun in the south, it, talking to people here in the northern hemisphere. So in the winter, when you want free heat and light, that tank's going to be shading it out, making your house colder and less comfortable. If we're more conscious about how the the sun changes its path in the sky in the various seasons. It's low in the sky in winter, always in the southern part of the sky. And it's very high in the sky in summer, rising in the northeast, setting in the northwest. Just knowing that and other patterns that I illustrate in the book, we can set up our tanks and or our plantings, particularly our trees, so they let in the maximum amount of winter heat and light so we can heat our homes, our gathering areas, our garden, for free when we need the heat. 
And then they can provide maximum shade and cooling in summer when we need that shade and cooling. So this way we get the greatest benefit when we need it at the expense of no harm in any other season. And to take that further, you know, how might you place an above ground rainwater tank to also double as a privacy screen where you might need one or a section of property fence? So you can, you know, that then eliminates the need for that fencing or screen made another way. How can we set up the tank in a way that we don't need a pump? We can just use gravity to get the water in and gravity to get the water out to where we need it. So that's what I mean by integrate, you know, more integrated thinking. It's if we're more conscious from the get-go of the possibilities, the potential. So we're looking that, looking for that at the get-go. We're much more likely to create a much more effective dynamic design and much less likely to make some unconscious mistakes. And I, I've just found that to be huge. One of the things I love about the way you think in your books is you've done all the heavy lifting so that all we have to do is consume the content and then think through the process. We still have to think through it because you'll have to look at your space and overlay what you're talking about, what Brad's talking about in your space. Well, I've been trying to. <laughs> I don't think I've done it all, but I've done a lot of it. There's, there's always more that we haven't considered. And actually that's, if I may, Greg, that's one thing I wanted to bring up in, in these uh, open-ended guidelines or principles that I give in the book. I just wanted to point out that while I find they're very effective at enabling people to do more with less, there's a, there's a risk, and sometimes people misuse them. And I'd say that's when people use it like a checklist. You know, it's in, they use it in a mechanical, non-thinking way. So, for example, I have uh, that principle I mentioned earlier of start at the top and of your watershed and work down. So someone might say, okay, I'll follow that principle, and I'm going to put my rainwater tank on the high part of my yard. So I can use gravity to direct water from my roof into it for free, and then I can direct water from the tank to all points below. So they think, okay, I started at the top, I'm done. Okay, that's where I'd say they've made a mistake, is they think they're done. So the principles, they're meant to for us to use them you know, as questions that we just keep asking ourselves, did I do this to the greatest extent possible? Did I really start at the top everywhere I could, or did I miss something? An example being, maybe people place the tank in a good way as I just spoke to, but their overflow pipe from the tank just drops right down to the ground at the base of the tank. Oftentimes, if people have a slope on their site, they've, they've missed a huge opportunity because the overflow of that tank, it's at the top of the tank. They've got this free elevation, this potential. If they could keep that overflow pipe high as long as possible, like maybe run it along their property fence, they could outlet the overflow end of that pipe at an even higher point in the landscape, thereby enabling much more area to be irrigated for free. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to actually jump in here. You and yeah. I put in a rainwater harvesting tank, and I'm not a great big fan of tanks. I, I think we need to direct the water and put it in the landscape. But when you do put in tanks, th this is something really good to think about because the overflow that we put on this tank here at the house, and this was in two, back in 2004, it, the water flows up and down the pipe all the way to the bottom of the tank and then out into the yard. And what I hear you saying is there's a better way of doing it. And that better way is exiting the excess rainwater at the top of the tank and then letting it run down, giving you some, uh, some better ear elevation to irrigate from. Yeah, well, and if I recall, Greg, your tank, it's got like a toilet tank overflow. Um, yes, exactly. I, okay, so the, the overflow pipe is tall within your tank. So the, the water level in your tank, it has to fill the whole tank before it would, will start spilling into the top of the pipe, which is vertical inside your tank. Yep. Okay, so that's all great. That's perfect. Awesome. But then when that pipe leaves your tank, rather than just outlet, if you had, you have a pretty flat site, but if you had a more of a sloped site, instead of just outletting the pipe somewhere right by the tank, it would be better to 
have a longer length of pipe leaving the tank and moving uphill to the highest part of the yard and outletting it there. And as long as it as the outlet of the pipe is lower than the inlet within the tank, it will work. That's called a wet system where water is always in the pipe. That's why it's called wet. Mm -hmm. But it will always overflow at the lowest point. The main thing I'm just trying to get across there is you know, a lot of people are like, okay, I put tank in, my tank in at the highest part of the property. I'm done. Move on. It's like, no, keep coming back. Keep pushing yourself. Keep trying to use these principles to find the thing you're not thinking of. Yeah. So if we use the principles as a checklist, we're just saying, good job. And we're only looking at w what we've already thought of. The, the way to really make the principles work to greatest effect is to use them to question, say, well, what have I not thought of yet? One of my favorite permaculture principles, and I mentioned this earlier in the interview, is protracted observation. You know, you've mentioned it several times too. What I've found, I've lived on this property for 30 years. I moved in in the fall of 1989. And even after 30 years, what I'm finding is that I still see things if I'm willing to look at them in a new way, I still see things that I can improve on, which is yeah. really incredibly cool. Yeah, and that, that's a great way at, at abating boredom. You don't get bored as long as you <laughs> keep seeing in new ways. Right, exactly. Exactly. I want to shift a little bit. And when we were starting this, before we started recording, I said, do you have water? And you said, hold on. And I heard you walk off and I heard you fill a glass with water. And when you walked back, I could hear you say in the background, and that is rainwater I'm drinking. Tell me about that. Yeah. All my domestic water is rainwater from my roof. So all the water I drink, I cook with, I wash with, I bathe with, it's all rainwater from just a 400 square foot roof because I live in a small, a small structure. Wow. One car garage turned cottage, like what that I like to call a garage, uh -huh. right? Shed size condo or shondo. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it's phenomenal. And a big thing I strive for in my design is how do we connect ourselves to the natural world more rather than disconnect ourselves from the natural world. So a big thing I love about having rainwater as my water source is I know exactly where that water came from. And I am motivated to keep my roof clean because that's the surface from which I collect my water. And uh, I am motivated when selecting parts for my water harvesting system to ensure I have no toxic parts. There's no lead in my plumbing. Right. And so on. And, uh, you know, I just want to share a story. I had the opportunity to teach in the West Bank. I met this Palestinian farmer who I was teaching with. And uh, he had come from a from another village, I noticed at every meal, he pulled a bottle out of his bag and it was filled with olive oil pressed from the fruit of his trees back home at his farm. And I said, what are you, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I, I travel with this olive oil everywhere I go to remind me of my home and all that I love and to remind me of my responsibility to do all I can to keep all that I love safe and healthy. I was just blown away by that. So now I've taken on his practice. So I travel everywhere I go with a bottle of my rainwater, which connects me back to to my passion, you know, my home, the world I love, you know, the family I love, and that water is sweet. Wow. Cuz rainwater has never touched the soil. Um, and thus, it's never picked up the minerals and the salts of the soil. So it's sweet in comparison to the water we're more we know, you know, from the municipal systems and whatnot. Right. And every time, you know, we see the desert flush with green after a rainstorm, that's for three reasons. Water's the obvious one. The next one is it's flushing salts out of the root zone, salts which are toxic to plants and the soil life. And rainwater is basically distilled water, so it flushes those salts away. And then the third is there's these micronutrients. So for example, when we get lightning storms, it converts atmospheric nitrogen, which is in a form that plants cannot use. You know, 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, but it's not in a form plants can use. But when we have a lightning storm, chemical reaction happens, and that atmospheric nitrogen is converted to a form that plants can use, and the raindrops bring the water right down to the plant's roots with that nitrogen that they can use. Nice. 
You know, I recently, so, I recently heard that and it was like, really? Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's sweet for us. It's sweet for the plants. Nice. <laughs> Nice. And uh, I want to actually shift on you now. And I'm going to, I want to throw this out to everybody listening out there. It's really important, first of all, that we get the word out about rainwater and gray water harvesting. Secondly, Brad is, can I say you're the publisher of this book? Yes. Yeah. You, Brad's the publisher of this book and he's taken it on himself to make sure that this data is available. And, you know, I really want to shout out to you, all my listeners out there to support him and get this book. So I want to talk about a couple of things that everybody can do out there or some people can do out there to help support Brad and getting the word out about this book and support him by buying the book. And one of them is, are any schools using the books as textbooks and and what kind of results are you seeing? Yeah, so it's been great in that uh, there's a local high school here uses it in their science and gardening class. There's a local elementary school, Monzo Elementary, uses it. Um, they've got this phenomenal school garden program where the kids are doing their math in the garden as they're figuring out how much water will their plants need. And then they uh, plant to grow crops that will thrive within their water budget. They use on-site harvested rainwater to irrigate their crops. They've done all kinds of water tests to show that all is healthy. They then have a farmer's market and the kids figure out how much money it costs to grow their crops. And then they set the price so that they uh, don't lose money but can keep going. It's, it's been phenomenal. And then at the university, there's a rainwater harvesting class that uses my book as a textbook. And that's been bringing about huge change on the university campus. When they started the class, their goal was for the first half of the semester to assess where is there a water harvesting need, maybe to reduce flooding or to enhance the health of the landscape. And then the second half of the semester, they implement it. So it's not just working the mind, it's also working the muscle. And by doing so, they are slowly transforming the University of Arizona campus from a rain draining, more water consumptive landscape to a rain harvesting, more water conserving landscape with each semester. And the students of this course also got positions on the University of Arizona's Stormwater Advisory Committee. Oh, nice. And by doing that, they started pushing for more of this. And they so inspired the grounds crews on campus that the grounds crews started implementing guerrilla installations of water harvesting without their superiors okay. <laughs> um, nice. And they're, 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 they're telling me this in a meeting in front of their superiors. And their superiors are like, what? What's going on? And then, so then they say, yeah, you remember how the tennis courts used to flood in every storm? And the supervisor's like, yeah. I said, well, does it flood anymore? No. Well, why do you think that is? And the groundskeeper said, because we started implementing these passive water harvesting rain gardens all around the tennis courts. So now they don't contribute or drain water to the courts. They take water off the courts. And uh, so just seeing those kind of transformations has been amazing. And I think the youth who uh, they won't be the youth much longer. They're going to they're going to totally leapfrog us on this because they started so much earlier. Nice. I mean, I didn't get exposed to this until after college. Right. The fact that you got uh, even kinder kindergartners getting exposed to this is just great. It's phenomenal. Yeah. So if you're a teacher out there in many capacities, grade, you know, grade kindergarten through college, uh, you know, think about using rainwater harvesting for drylands and beyond as part of your curriculum. And how can people help promote your books and this work? Yeah. First off, go out there and get the books, read them. I strongly recommend you buy them off my website, harvestingrainwater.com, because you can buy the books direct from me. No middle person takes a cut. And I actually uh, dramatically reduced the price of my books on my website. So I sell it to you at deep discount. Then highlight it on social media. Say, hey, look, I got these books. Or you know, take before photos of your yard before you start implementing stuff. And then after photos. So you see the transformation. You can go back to that. And you can show others. Ask that your local libraries carry the book. Not just the public library, but all the school libraries, too. Another public library. But ask them to carry it as well. And ask your local bookstores to carry it. And then another really key thing. Once you've read the book, if you enjoy it, 
please, please rate and review the book online at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, wherever. Even if you did not get the book there from them, you can still rate and review the book on those sites. And and Goodreads is another online site where you can rate and review the books. Because all that makes a, a huge difference in the search in the search engines. Uh, and it pulls the books up much more readily, so people are much more likely to be exposed to the books. Well, and yours, both of them, if you buy them both, you really don't need any other rainwater or gray water harvesting books, right? Yeah, I set them up so that they're they're the tool I always wanted. I, I actually wrote the books out of frustration when I initially got into all this water harvesting is I, I could find information, but it was just in these little bits and pieces and so many different scattered resources. So I wanted a real easy go to one stop shop resource. And so that was my my primary motivation to create the books. Um, they're the books that I always wanted. Nice. And more. Yeah. Nice. Well, congratulations on that. That is phenomenal. And so once again, how can people find out more? Where can they find the books? Yeah. So go to harvestingrainwater.com. Don't just check out the shop where you can buy the books, but there's also lots of free uh, videos, other guides and imagery and resources to be sure to to check all that out and also check out the events page because i'm doing now that i've got the books out i'm doing a lot more public events public presentations workshops and so on and i'm continually adding them to the events page on my website nice maybe we should have you back and do a an hour-long intro to water harvesting webinar online so everybody can check it out there i like that cool well, thank you so much for all of that great information, Brad. And your website, once again, is? HarvestingRainwater.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and thank you so much for joining us on the show once again. It's always great to chat with you and learn. I, you know, I always have a few takeaways. So we can find you on your website, HarvestingRainwater.com. Any other places you hang out? They can also look me up on Facebook. Just uh, Brad Lancaster, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. They can check me out on Twitter, at Water Harvester. Hopefully they'll catch me out on a dance floor dancing Rueda or Contra. Nice. And doing the Abun dance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another thing where people can check me out is the Odyssey Storytelling Podcast. I've been doing more and more live storytelling events. And, really? Uh, yeah. All right. So you got my in interest now. Tell me about what that's about and who does it. <laughs> so maybe you, you're more familiar with uh, the national podcast, uh, The Moth, where they um, host live storytelling events where people will tell a 10 minute story with no notes. It has to be a true story is true to the teller of the tale. Um, it has to be their tale, not someone else's tale. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing this. I just I really enjoy it. You know, coming from a household where my dad was a phenomenal storyteller around the dinner table. This is just taking it to a, a larger family dinner, if you will. It's fantastic because you can try different things out and you get immediate feedback by the live audience. So, and, and they charge you up as you're, you're in front of all these people. Is this yeah. a live in person thing or over the phone? Yeah. 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 Oh, so all the podcasts are recorded at live events. Wow. And what's yeah. the name of the podcast? Odyssey Storytelling Podcast. Wow. Are they based in Tucson? Yes, yes. So I'd have to come, if I wanted to do it, I'd have to come down to Tucson. Yeah, and you can also do The Moth. The Moth regularly hosts events in Phoenix. I don't know that I know what that is. The Moth, M-O-T-H? Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, it's just like the Odyssey storytelling one. And uh, I think they, they call it The Moth because uh, they started it on someone's front porch. And the light they had on to light them up at night as they told stories would attract the, all these moths. So thus the name. And now they host events in cities across the country. And they, they likewise record the stories and then broadcast them via their podcast. Oh my gosh. Ah, so I got to go look this up because this sounds fascinating. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us on the show, Brad. We greatly appreciate it. Your uh, website one more time. Harvestingrainwater.com.
please go to that website, harvestingrainwater.com. Get one of Brad's books. Get both of Brad's books. Learn about rainwater harvesting. Support him in this process. I've known Brad for almost 30 years. I, In retrospect, you and I were talking recently, and I realized that I was one of the teachers at your permaculture design course, what, back in 1992? 1993. 1993. Wow. So we've known each other almost 30 years. And the work that Brad does in the world is revolutionary. So please support him. You can also find notes from today's podcast at herb at urbanfarm.org forward slash rain harvest. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and are interested in listening to my first podcast series, Freshly Green from 2007, you can subscribe to support the Urban Farm podcast. With that, you will have access to Freshly Green and so much more bonus content. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to find out more and to pledge your support. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.